So uh, the alliance of uh, uh, Free Democrats, SDS, right, it has become by this time, um, well, how should we put it, a liberal party in both the traditional sense of free market and so on, uh, uh, but also in the what in the U.S. are called, you know, social issues and whatever, um, more um, cosmopolitan, uh, less traditionalist, uh, less, in a way, less rooted in the, let's say, more specifically Hungarian uh, ethos and culture, and that will, you know, that will come back to haunt them, uh, because they will be perceived as sort of alien. Uh, later on, and slowly but surely. So both free market, you know, these sort of, um, uh, you know, laissez-faire, you know, typical liberalism. So, in a way, uh, we, I couldn't say libertarian, but liberal in all aspects, so to speak, right? Both economically, freedom of enterprise, individual, well, everybody's for that, right? But sort of this idea of the, let the market do its things and let it, you know, let it roam around and whatever happens, happens, sort of a thing. And in other issues, uh, social, moral, whatever you want to call them, cultural, liberal. Okay, um, so, and the, the Socialist Party will enter then, uh, the Social Democrats in, into this coalition with SDS. Uh, so, uh, and, and the other major force then on the right, it remains literally just Fidesz with a smaller MDF. So, <clears throat> so notice what has happened in the, up to this point, up to 2002 in the 90s, right? First, we had this, um, Obviously, first election, the opposition, which was already grouped into distinct um, uh, parties, wins the election, well, a part of it, right, wins the election, forms the, forms the, 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 and, uh, the government. Next election, 94, you have the reformed communists, the social democrats, in a coalition with the former opposition party, which is now a sort of a left, they call it left liberal. Um, and then you have the pendulum swinging back in 98 to a center-right where the major center-right parties, especially the MDF, the Hungarian Democratic Forum, um, and others wither away, and it's the Fides that grows and occupies that space, and then back the pendulum to 2002, but again with very narrow mar margins. So my point about the two poles that alternate, even if the parties that, that enter and exit the change, especially on the right, right, with the fragmentation, with the disappearance of many of the original um, uh, initial uh, center-right parties of their various forms, right? And the Fidesz, which, which kind of through its, through its ideological maturity, uh, uh, growing up, so to speak, right, uh, acquires this center-right, more traditionalist, uh, conservative uh, view. But again, remember, conservative doesn't mean what it means here at all. Um, okay. Good, so that's, uh, that's uh, the 2002 uh, parliament, the prime minister um, uh, is Medyashi, I didn't mention his name because he will resign in two years after the first elections to the European Parliament, uh, after Hungary enters the European Union in 2004, there's, there are the first elections to the European Parliament, uh, where the socialists are defeated, the social democrats, and uh, he resigns as in consequence of that, so the, then the prime minister becomes this guy, Ferenc who is an very interesting personality. Basically, an, an equally powerful personality as the, who by now is the leader of the right, which is uh, Viktor Orban, right, remember. And in fact, if you remember Viktor Orban, he was the person who, at the reburial of Nagy Imre in 1989, right, the reburial of the hero of the revolution of 1956, this was this young student who, who gave a very fiery speech in 1989, in which he demanded that the Soviet's uh, troops uh, leave once and for all uh, Hungary and so on. But that's, you know, it was a key moment, this reburial of Imranoid in, for the changes of 1989. So, you know, he always was a strong voice, a strong personality. <coughs> now he becomes sort of a leader on the right, he was just prime minister, very young, 35 years old, uh, and uh, believe it or not, that is young. Uh, and uh, uh, so, that's in 98 to 2002. Now, in the, uh, on the left, the, the, the kind of the major percentage becomes this French Jewish and it really is like the mirror, <laughs> the mirror image in a way, in many ways, a very opinionated, very, very much on the left, very much on the left, but on the on this sort of a, you know, new left, right? This is not left in which it actually it's a left, it's a sort of a liberal left, okay? It's uh, uh, left wing. It has this rhetoric of social whatever benefits. It's also very fiercely, you know, uh, free market, pro market, uh, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, laissez-faire, uh, whatever, uh, sort of a government. And that is, I told you, it happened to other uh, central-left parties in Europe. Social Democrats pick up this, this, uh, this trend. What you should note here is that it, it might remind us of what I mentioned in that lecture on the political ideologies. That the, you know, the origin of the two major, the two major ideologies that form in the beginning of modernity, conservatism and liberalism. Conservatism was for the traditional state, for the traditional society. Um, it was wary of uh, this idea of a free market, while liberalism stand, stood for uh, individualism and freedom in all aspects of life, okay? but also for a strong state. Uh, so individualism and freedom in the market, free market, free, that's liberal, that's classical liberalism. Okay? And also in all other things, right? but a sort of a negative uh, liber liberty, this idea that seemed, I'm sure will sound familiar to you, that you know, you're free to do whatever you want unless you hurt someone else. You know, sounds familiar? Yes, because you live in a liberal society. Uh, and both American parties are liberal, forms of liberalism actually. Uh, classical liberalism. But what you see in Central and Eastern Europe will be something else, and this is why it might sound unfair, because you live in a liberal society. This is not a liberal society in the sense of classical liberalism, right? Remember what they went through and what was their trajectory. They, they, these states and political systems, political cultures, were not shaped during liberalism and stu stood there. The United States was born at the, you know, John Locke is one of the fathers of liberalism, well, he is almost quoted in the Declaration of Independence and so on. That's liberalism. That's not the case here, right? So you will see that this is why the, 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 the right, the center right here, not the extreme right, the center right here is a different sort of a center right. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a more, has elements like the nation, a more organic view of the, uh, of the society, more rooted in traditional values, in Christian values, depending on the, on the country, uh, and so on. And there's, there's also another right which is more, uh, you know, sort of European style center right. Uh, Western European style center right, uh, more pro market, uh, more a liberal center uh, right, and then there's a traditionalist center right. And in almost every country, think law and justice and OP in the um, in the in the in Poland, right? Also, uh, also, so so you see this, right? The same thing you will see in in Hungary slowly um, but surely clarifying, right? Uh, a, a, a center left that is basically a mix of of uh, social democracy, but also uh, economic liberalism, strangely, right? And uh, uh, a center right that is more traditionalist, uh, more nation oriented, national, so to speak, uh, uh, that slowly but surely will, 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 will de emphasize this idea that, oh, you know, just let the market do whatever it wants, because that might not help the, the country, actually. But it's not, we're not yet there. We're not yet there. Okay, so 2002 to 2006, you have this again uh, uh, a coalition of uh, free democrats, a sort of a, you know classical liberals or libertarians even, with uh, uh, with the social uh, democrats. 19, uh, in 2005, you have uh, the parliament again elects a president, uh, a different president who is, as I mentioned, a former president of the Constitutional Court. So again, this idea that the president represents the state and is a guardian of the legality, of the, of the very backbone, of the very system of the, of, the, of the state, right? So electing a former president of the Constitutional Court is, um, you know, uh, is very suggestive, very telling. Uh, he, Shoyo Naso is his name, you have the name in the, here um, on the chart. The interesting thing about electing the president, remember the president is elected by the parliament with a two-thirds majority. Well, who was the two-thirds? Like, how can you get the two-thirds? Uh, the most natural choice would be that you would probably have the governing coalition, right, who are in power now, the socialists and the free democrats electing. But no, but no. Because the, the free democrats opposed the socialist candidate, who was a very, well, very socialist uh, 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 candidate, a uh, lady. Um, uh, and they oppose that, and actually, the ones that will elect this sort of a center-right um, uh, candidate for the presidency will be the Social Democrats and Fidesz and MDF, actually, interestingly enough. So they will elect the, they will form the two-thirds majority to elect this, uh, this president. Okay, uh, 2006, you have again parliamentary elections, and this is the first time since 1989 that 
the governing coalition is re-elected, is re-elected. And, uh, well, again, with a very narrow, right, a, narrow, very, a fairly narrow uh, uh, win. In this election, notice a few interesting things that MDF, the Hungarian Democratic Forum, runs separately from Fidesz in, the idea, in this idea of not getting engulfed, not getting swallowed in by this growing catch-all center-right party with Fidesz under the leadership, very strong leadership of Viktor Orban. So they run uh, separately, and not only that, they run sort of against the major, the other parties. And that gives you a sense of what's going on. There is clearly an anti-system feel, there is clearly a disaffection with the elite, with the entire elite in, uh, in the Hungarian society, just like we've seen in the other countries. Remember, we're getting closer to 2010, which I described as, well, if not 2010, but thereabouts, sort of a watershed, a new watershed moment, 25 years, uh, well, 20 years uh, after the 1999. And in, in many ways, it, it is here as well, as you see. But, so MDF kind of tries to portray itself as a third, it's very hard to portray yourself as, a, as an alternative in one, something that becomes, a, that is starting to become a very much of a two-party system, or almost a two-pole system, it's so clear that it's very hard to position yourself, remember. Now, in, in a regular political system where, okay, this is where the, how the voters are distributed, most are in the middle, right? When you have significant uh, catch-all parties, right, umbrella parties, Parties that try to get almost as much as they can from each side. Where do you situate yourself as a smaller party? It's very hard, right? Because you either are the extreme, which is not what the Hungarian Democratic Forum was, right? For the extreme left or extreme right, or somewhere in the middle. But the middle is the hardest thing because you look like, uh, to the voter, you look like you don't have a clear identity. These casual parties are, we are the center right, we are the center left. It's a very telling, very you know, clear message, right, to which the voters uh, react, right, easily. But who is? What does it mean that to be in the middle, right? <laughs> or, or what sort of a? What's your niche, right? And that's that's the hard part. However, they do uh, get in the uh, in the parliament uh, a very you know eleven seats, so barely, barely. They get five percent here for uh, for the single member district, whatever. Uh, the point is that they made it the point <laughs> that they will not form a coalition with Viktor Orban's Fidesz, that they will remain, uh, or will not be engulfed by them. Even with MDF, they would not have enough to have a majority. So that was kind of a, kind of a loss for Fidesz, because they expected to come back with a vengeance, and they did not come back with a vengeance. Um, notice some other parties that are around that I want to, to point out. Uh, it's this. So MIEP, uh, the Hungarian um, Justice and Truth Party, um, has been a an extreme right, sort of a further right uh, party, but now it allies itself with this new group called Yobik, about which we'll talk in a second, which is a kind of a young nationalistic extreme right group, right? Uh, they don't get in the parliament, but it's important to remark the, uh, the, the kind of the rise of Yobik, okay? Um, and that's about it. I obviously deleted other parties that were not relevant, didn't get into the party. Okay, so you're going to say, well, that sounds, that sounds like stability. That's a sign of stability. 2006, you have elections, the socialists win. Uh, sort of, uh, you know, sort of an apathetic election, to be honest. Um, and also, uh, in this conundrum in which the Viktor Orban was courting MDF and saying, well, we are on the same side, and the MDF leader was a, was a, a woman, uh, she would make it very clear, very adamant, no, 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 <laughs> we're not the same thing. Uh, it was an interesting uh, situation. Uh, okay, but what happens next is, uh, is, uh, is remarkable. What happens next is remarkable. Uh, because what happens next is that very soon after the election, in the electoral campaign, okay. in the electoral campaign, you had Fidesz accusing the social democrats, the socialists, uh, the, the existing government coalition of mismanaging the economy, of nothing. It didn't have strong effect. Soon after the election, a few months later, uh, a recording that I posted on Canvas, that I'm going to ask you to, to listen to, it's short and it's translated, um, it is leaked from a party conference, party meeting of the social democrats, in which the Again, now, again, Prime Minister Ferenc Uh says with very explicitly, meaning also with explicit uh, curse words and so on, that 
situation in which the party and the governance finds itself is unimaginable. Because they have basically done nothing for four years, and this is soon after winning the election, by the way, in which they have done none of the necessary reforms in four years, in which he says that we have lied morning, even, uh, noon, and evening every day to the people by lying to them, including obviously in the campaign, about the true situation of the economy, okay? Uh, and then we have done such a nonsense of this governance, like really narrowly escaping getting into the dumpster, uh, that nobody else in Europe has done such a thing. And that is what he says. Now, why did he say that? You know, he has a, again, he's a very strong personality, he has this style of, uh, you know, saying, uh, being very direct and saying outrageous things and whatever. And it was a party conference, so maybe he was just caught up in the fire of the rhetoric. But that does not sound good. And it does have a truth basis. It does have a truth basis, in, in the, as we will discover soon. As they will discover, they discovered soon. But you can imagine the impact of this, of this speech, and the impact of that this speech had on the Hungarian society. I mean, um, well, just put yourself in their shoes, right? This resulted in street, out of state manifestations. The, uh, the, the Fidesz refused to even participate in parliamentary discussions. They, they abstained from uh, attending parliament because the big popular demand, well, the, the significant popular demand was to Jewishine resign tomorrow, Prime Minister to resign tomorrow. And he would not resign. And he would not resign. He said, well, this is the truth, and I was saying the truth, and whatever. Uh, this resulted in, uh, in 2000. Uh, 6 November, at the anniversary of 50 years from the Hungarian Revolution, in massive street riots. Massive street riots, which was all turned also violent. They tried to occupy the parliament, to occupy the, the, the TV station, and it was a mess because the response was completely uh, 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 disorganized, uh, the incompetent. I mean, it was just bad, just bad. This also involved some of the more radicalized forces, and thank you, Big here, uh, which is. Um, uh, which is a far-right force, and soon it will become a major far-right force. And if you can imagine how much it accentuated, you know, in this apathetic situation, pre-election apathetic situation, the, which was characterized by, you know, sort of a disaffection with the elites, uh, uh, disaffection with the elites, with, the, with existing political elites, just like in all the other countries we have discussed. Uh, you, you imagine that how much this has accentuated. We have been lied. We have been lied by the political elite. We have been uh, you know, uh, I mean, this is this is all nonsense. We need a complete change. We need a complete reform, a complete uh, 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 turning around, and so on. Well, again, your child will not resign, so it will be a couple of years of complete uh, 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 embarrassment. I mean, completely uh, strange situation in which you have a mass part, a massive part of the population completely rejecting the government, a delegitimized government. Um, and which, by the way, usually affects harder than the smaller parties in the in the coalition government usually, because why do they align themselves with such people? Uh, and but he would not resign. And then comes the 2008 economic crisis, which will hit Hungary very hard. It will hit Hungary very hard because many people were deeply in debt. They took out loans, and the banks just raised the, 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 the uh, return rates and so on, so many people found themselves in the direst of situations. So it hit Hungary really hard, and immediately thereafter, turns out that Hungary is, you have the Greece, uh, the Greece uh, bankruptcy uh, soon thereafter and so on, or almost bankruptcy, and it turns out that Hungary was basically in the same situation. That Hungary was, it had such high, it has, that this Georgian government has been putting Hungary in debt, that it has basically maintained the state of the economy on loans, on loans, so not by reforming the economy, but by getting loans from abroad and so on, to which probably Zhou Chang made the reference when he said we didn't do anything and we lied to the population and so on. So, so all of this happens, Zhou Chang eventually resigns, he eventually resigns, and the technocratic government is appointed, uh, led by Gordon uh, Boyai, uh, remember what a technocratic government is from my uh, lecture on the Czech Republic. So yes, they also have a technocratic caretaker government, not the same word, not the synonyms, uh, with MSP and SDS support. So with the same coalition support in Parliament, you have a specialist government 
maintaining governance until the next elections, which is, which is 2010. <laughs> These 2010 elections, so if you can imagine, these parties who have been in government are completely compromised. In fact, uh, the major parties of the Social Democrats fall apart. Uh, the SDS, as you will see, also falls apart. So it's the destruction of the center-left. It's the self-destruction of the center-left, in which you have splinter groups uh, bickering, fighting each other. On the right, you have uh, MDF kind of wastes away, uh, but as you see in the election, but it's Fidesz in coalition with this, the Christian Democratic People's Party, who, um, remember, it's one of those pre-war parties who was in government or was around in the 90s, then it kind of disappeared and then it became allied with Fidesz, sort of almost part of Fidesz. The, it used to be a pre-communist uh, pre party. So that's on the right. So <laughs> what's interesting in the 2010 elections, in the run-up to the 2010 election, the Fidesz, the leader of Fidesz, Viktor Orban, because, you know, in campaigns, is, is the leader of the party who you know that will become prime minister, who kind of is the face of the party. And just like in other countries, there will be debates usually between the leaders of the major parties who would be automatically also the candidates for prime ministers from those parties, right? Sort of like the equivalent of presidential candidates here. Um, and usually you have these tele televised debates, right? Viktor Orban refused to debate anyone. Anyone, because he knew that Fidesz didn't have to, to move a finger. It actually didn't have to say anything. This whole campaign uh, leading up to 2010 elections was was truly, truly very uh, fascinating because, I mean, finally they get to throw out the bombs, and truly, right, in this case, right, and Fidesz just had to ride the wave of discontent. This huge wave of discontent with, you know, we have been lied. And Fidesz indeed, as a result of this, wins incredibly, incredibly, two-thirds of the parliament. Two-thirds of the parliament in a multi-party system. And remember what two-thirds of the parliament means. Two-thirds means that with two-thirds you can change the constitution, you can pass a constitution, you can pass uh, fundamental laws, you can elect the president, you can do whatever you want with two-thirds, and that all is won by one party. Fidesz won basically in a coalition with the Christian Democrats, but they are like a minor you know, uh, addition there. Um, and then, uh, look at the Hungarian Socialist Party. Uh, it gets 59 seats, right, of 386, okay? So it gives you a sense of, of the crushing... Fidesz gets 52% of the vote. I mean, uh, getting 50% of the seats in a system that, even if it's MMP, kind of inflates the majority, would not be outrageous. But getting 52% of the vote in a multi-party system, that is amazing, right? Not of the seats, of the vote. And that is, that is incredible, the multi-party system. So it gives you a sense. But here's also, who, who is the third party? MDF is gone, SDS, the Alliance of Free Democrats, disappears, really is, is destroyed by, 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 by what just happened. Jobbik becomes the third party, with only 3% of the vote less, getting only 3% less vote than the socialists. Jobbik, who is what? This ex truly extreme right, anti-Semitic, anti-foreigner, xenophobic, isolationist, anti-European, I mean really there's nothing you can throw at them that wouldn't apply. And I'm not using hyperbole, I avoid it. Right? This is, but that's what Jobbik is. It is one of the true, uh, you know, they don't, uh, so true extreme right, uh, 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 nationalistic, xenophobic, again, as I said, racist, anti-gypsy, whatever. It's all there, anti-democratic, clearly anti-democratic. They have not, you know, they are an anti a true anti-system party. They are a dangerous force who becomes a third force in the parliament, right? Not right, the third force in the parliament. Clearly not allied with Fidesz. I mean, Fidesz makes it very. It's a very interesting game that Fidesz plays and will play in, in afterwards uh, because they will not. They will throw jabs at Jobbik, but they will not want to alienate the potential voters of Jobbik because they want to attract them. Right? Fidesz wants to be the casual party without being extreme. So, in fact, you know, uh, after these elections, I used to say that um, uh, my, uh, one of my points was that, uh, you know, people should root for Fidesz to be successful because that's the mainstream alternative on the center-right, because the extreme-right alternative, which uh, is, is extremely dangerous, it's truly an anti-system party. And where, where are we? Where are we? 2010, right? 
a time of, as I mentioned in the other countries, democratic fatigue, a fatigue with this whole democratic transition, with this whole transition, a time where, you know, if you make the sum of, of what happened after 1989, most of the people will say we didn't get where we wanted to get. We wanted to be, you know, well, it's not very clear, right? It's like hope and change. What does it mean, right? It's, it's vague, right? Uh, uh, so it's always a dangerous thing to, to, to have these huge promises or huge ideas because it, they never get fulfilled. The, vague, the more vague they are, the more attractive they are, but when it gets to fulfilling them, because everybody imagines them to mean something else, nobody will be satisfied. It's a very dangerous game, right? Which will, you know, actually uh, will affect in many parties, actually, I mean, in the... Uh, for example, Western Europe since the 90s, this sort of a, uh, uh, this sort of a game of, prom of, of, of creating a very wonderful um, image and, and then falling, you know, the higher you are, the harder you fall, right? So, uh, so it's not a strange phenomenon, right? It's a, it's, it's a common phenomenon, right? Uh, it, and it has to do with this, idea, with this idea that, you know, a revolution or an election, you know, it's always predicated on a promise of a future, right? And that's one thing to win an election or a revolution, and the other thing is to win the governance, which is a completely different game. Right? Governing and winning an election are two different sets of skills. So applying that to this situation, right, changing the regime and then creating something else, but what else? What else? Remember that remember the, the radicality of this change that all these countries endured after 1990, right? Or went through after 1990. Um, and, and at this point, there, there are these reconsiderations, right? Have we really done a regime change? What does it mean, a regime change? And to give an answer to this, that's a very hard, because what is the answer? Okay, we want to be like the West. What does it mean, the West, right? Uh, is it this free market? But the free market, this is after the, the 2008 economic crisis. What did it bring? It bring, brought out banks that kind of took the skin out of us, and, uh, and, and debt, and, uh, you know, lots of people rising inequality. So where... Where are we? It's not that we want, definitely nobody wants communism, obviously, like none of that, right? There's no communist party here. That's absurd, right? Nobody wants to be crushed by an oppressive authoritarian regime. That's not the idea, right? But what is the alternative? Is this, you know, Western model, the secular, whatever, uh, relativistic, whatever, is this what we want? And clearly the political culture in Hungary said no, said no. Because as the S who kind of stood for that, disappeared, both for the, you know, rambling, wild free market and the, you know, relativistic sort of a, a liberal mindset, they, they, they did not get any, you know, there isn't enough population to vote for them, there is a niche, but there isn't enough. And clearly, the one that, that, that got, and kind of formulating an answer uh, that resonated with a part of the Hungarian population, a significant part clearly was Fidesz, clearly was Fidesz. Uh, and farther to the right, Jobbik, you know, nourished this sort of a disappointment with uh, remember the Weimar Republic in Germany, if you know anything about it, right? It was wonderfully democratic, but a complete failure economically. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can be wonderful in rhetoric, but if the economy doesn't work, it all goes to the dumpster. And Weimar Republic was followed by Hitler. So, this is a, you know, uh, just because you have democracy, the state also needs to work economically and so on and socially. So, Jobbik is an anti-system, anti-democratic response, like, uh, you know, that is similar to the example I just gave. Because it's an extreme right in which, no, you know what, throw this all out, we need to make a nationalistic state, uh, isolationist is just us, and, and so on. And, you know, racial hatred and whatever. So, that is a type of response, you know, let's throw everybody, you know, everything else out. Notice another anti-reform party. Remember that this is the time when we saw it in Poland, we see it in the Czech, we saw it in the Czech Republic, also in Hungary, and you see it in other countries. Around 2010, there are these parties that come up as a response to the tiredness of the population with the existing post-1989 elite. After two decades, these guys didn't have not delivered, we need something else. Well, what was this something else? Again, Fidesz will manage to... You, they will soon, as you see, will, will bring something very much different. Your pick is clearly something different. LMP, notice what the name is of LMP. Politics can be different. That's the name of the party. Politics can be different is the name of the party. Well, it tells you what it stands for. Ideologically, this is a sort of a, 
uh, center left um, combined with uh, classical liberal ecologist the green sort of a party but it's, it's clearly a, a reform party mostly organized by members of the civil society so non-governmental organizations non-profits so no politicians remember notice remember um, uh, Poland remembering Czech Republic all these forces that come out towards 2010 that are you know either led by journalists by businessmen by weird you know sort of a Sources, right? Non politicians, because that's the idea. The politicians have failed, the political elite has failed, have failed us. We need something else. Now, what is that else is the big question. It is the big question because remember, you know, uh, politics has its own rules, and politics is the only solution to come to street, street fighting, basically. Politics is, is, you know, democratic politics, the fact that we resolve conflicts in a, an institution called the parliament where all these conflicts that are naturally in any society there is, it's natural to disagree, that is part of the, the, the nature of any society the question is how you create common action out of this disagreement where existent, the parliaments, the existence of parliaments are elected where different parties represent these different, opi different opinions and they debate it and fight it out according to rules, of the, to, rules to establish rules and not with sticks and guns politics is the only solution to violence. This is why wars happen when, when such institutions disappear or fall apart. This is why the civil war in the U.S. happened when the South removed itself from the Congress, when there was no longer an, a, a place to debate these inevitable, inevitable differences. And that's something that we need to that that is part of understanding the nature of of of, of a society of democratic politics that conflict is inevitable and parliaments. Uh, the, the tools of, of democratic representation and debate are the only solution except for violence. Okay? So, but that's part of learning these, these, uh, these skills. And by the way, just because one was born in a democratic society or representative society doesn't mean that we have these skills. Because we always think that, oh, think of the, the, how, pop, how unpopular Congress is in the US. It's an institution with the lowest rate of acceptance or popularity in the, in the, in the, uh, in the population. While the president usually is much higher. Why? Because the people want one leader, right? And that's completely undemocratic, of course, right? Because the essence of democracy is the fact that these conflicts are inevitable and they have to be played out somewhere. Well, that playing out somewhere, right, is a skill, uh, you know, that, that needs to be accepted. You need to accept the fact that uh, there are limitations to what politics can do and there are specific rules to the game of, uh, and to the, the to the game of politics, to, uh, beyond to the nature of politics. What you notice in all these countries is a sort of a tiredness with that. Also a sense of be having been, again, as I said, uh, of, of politics not having delivered what 1989 has promised. Okay? And you have all these non-political forces appearing, or anti-political, or anti-system, uh, reform, and whatever, whatever. In Hungary, these are the ones that I just mentioned. Okay, 2010. You also have the 2010 presidential. The, the National Assembly elects the president. Now, remember who elects the president? The, the, the National Assembly, the Parliament. Uh, who has two thirds? Fidesz has two thirds of the seats. So Fidesz basically elects a president according to its like, like someone who has been associated with Fidesz for a long time. Uh, Schmidt Pahl, who was an Olympic fencing champion, uh, has been involved in uh, Olympic uh, and sport uh, the, um, diplomacy for a long time, um, and uh, has been a member of the European Parliament and so on. So, uh, someone who, who had international prestige and also from the world of sports, so sort of sort of outside politics, although it has, he has always been associated with Fidesz. So you say, okay, well that sounds nice and so on. Well, well, it didn't turn out that nice, because two years later, a huge scandal erupts, which actually happened in many countries, similar scandals happen in many countries, which is an interesting subject. Uh, a plagiarism scandal, because it turns out that his PhD dissertation, which he wrote in 1990, or there about 1992, uh, it turns out it was plagiarized, it was many pages were copied verbatim from other authors, uh, uh, other books, and it's kind of shady, so whatever, but this is a fact, so uh, there's a huge scandal. And remember why this is important, because this is the president in the parliamentary system whose role is mostly symbolic and moral, uh, standing for legality, uh, the, 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 the state as such, uh, democracy, the functioning of the system. So, you know, this moral 
above politics, enduring authority, well, such a scandal hits exactly at the heart of that role, right? So he will have to uh, resign, and he, he, he resigned uh, in uh, 2012, so you have a new election for the president when Adel Janos is elected, a, a long-standing Fidesz politician. So in this case, you have a president who is clearly allied with the two-thirds majority. Why is this important? Why is this important? Because between 2010 and 2014, under the leadership of Viktor Orban, who becomes president after 2010, uh, president, sorry, prime minister, of course, after 2010, you have um, something uh, uh, going on that is, is quite unique and interesting. Fidesz, first of all, Fidesz will pass a new constitution. I'm saying Fidesz because, and uh, the Christian Democrats because they have two-thirds and they can do that. And basically it's them, right? So this, uh, they will pass a new constitution in 2011, uh, becomes uh, the constitution in 2012. Uh, remember, Hungary has not had a new constitution written after 1990, um, just patching the old constitution. But they passed a completely new constitution, which I linked because it's really worth looking into and we'll ask you to look at the preamble and the first, basically, uh, so there's the national avowal, which is sort of a preamble, and then there's the fundamental section, which I'm going to ask you to, to look at, which is, which is, well, it's a constitution that tries to re-establish the state on a different foundation. This is why it's called foundations, that section. And so here's what, here's what happened. This question mark that was raised after 20 years after 1989 is have we made this transition? Have we truly changed? Right? Because the revolution promises change, but changing to what? Have we truly changed? What has... And of course, this is a very fuzzy question and there is no clear answer. Well, here's Fidesz giving a clear answer of a very clear nature. Of a very clear nature in which it roots the new state. And this is the attempt that takes place between 2009 and 2014, which is why it's so fascinating. That Fidesz tries to re-establish the entire polis, the entire political system, the entire society, the state itself, on different fundamentals. On center-right fundamentals, on fundamentals rooted in Hungarian, uh, European uh, tradition, uh, on uh, cultural roots and Christian roots, and all of this uh, uh, together. A national, uh, um, uh, uh, based on national values, uh, the, the preservation and promotion of national values, of culture, and so on, on traditional values, and on Christian values, and on European values. And the state is no longer this sort of a, the way they imagine it is a, and the project is to re-establish Hungary, not for four years, not for five years, not for until the next mandate, but to re-establish the very Hungarian state in a different way. To re-establish it on this traditionalist, traditional, um, nationalist or national, not necessarily nationalist, national grounding, a Hungarian state which is proposed and right and understood as, a, as, as the true reform, the true reform that 1989, uh, after 1989 we haven't done it, we haven't done it, and now we will re-establish it as the way we really want it, the way we really want it, right? Uh, and this is a, we can consider it a classically conservative uh, answer, not American statism. Right. No, it's a classical conservative in which in which the uh, the idea is that the state, in in a very Hungarian you know way, right, in which the state is meant to serve the interests of the people of the nation. And I posted uh, on on Canvas uh, a, a famous speech by now that he gave uh, Viktor Orban gave in 2014. So so uh, very simply uh, to um, in uh, at the summer school. Uh, a yearly summer school that takes place in uh, Transylvania, Romania, um, and uh, organized by the Hungarian ethnics there. And anyway, there he describes aspects of this sort of a, 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 a program, a sort of a program, a sort of a really true regime change program. But notice that that here, unlike in the Poland or the Czech Republic, although in Poland law and justice actually seems to me to kind of follow the model that Orban set up. And, and they seem to go in the same direction to a degree. Remember law and justice, right? Um, uh, but the point is that in both in Poland and Czech Republic, you have these fringe parties, these reform parties emerging, uh, falling and falling apart. But here you have a, set, you know, a significant center-right catch-all party promoting this sort of a response to the promise of 1989. 
um, who also has the parliamentary political tools to do it, because they have two-thirds of the parliament obtained through a vote. It's a fascinating situation, it's a fascinating case, and it's worth uh, further examination, but you know, we have that much time. Um, so let me give you some examples of, of things that, that uh, we, we will talk soon, uh, actually in a second, about some of the, these things that, that, that he, will, uh, he will endeavor. Uh, in this part of sort of a, let me call it, you know, reimagining of the Hungarian state or, or regime, true regime change or new regime change, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so let's jump to the 2014 elections, the most recent ones, which are again won by Fidesz, again with two thirds. Meanwhile, however, the electoral system has changed. In 2012, whatever, 13, the electoral system has changed. I explained in the first part of the lecture, of this lecture, how it has changed into more mixed member majoritarian, which further inflates the, uh, so the, 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 the number of seats is, is more disproportionate versus the number of votes uh, uh, obtained than in MMPR, right? Where it's more related, it still inflates the, the number of uh, uh, the number of seats is larger than, for example, you get, you know, here, you have 44% of the vote, so you see they don't get 51% as in the previous elections, but they still get 66% of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the seats. In the previous election, which was MMPR, they got 51% of the vote and 66% and of the seats, so you see that it is more disproportionate, more inflates, uh, it's more majoritarian rather than proportional, okay? Uh, but again, this shouldn't be you know, a shock because, as I said, uh, this is the, actual, the electoral system in the US, UK is completely disproportional. It's not at all proportional. It, it's all majoritarian. It inflates, creates artificial majorities. But that being said, let's look at 2014 elections. So the winners are again Fidesz with the Christian Democratic People's Party, by now an established alliance in which the Christian Democratic People's Party kind of plays the role of the ideological watchdog and so on. <laughs> Notice the left. The left is hilarious, uh, <laughs> in the sense of what happened with it, uh, and, and it, it's fascinating. Uh, so first of all, the Hungarian Socialist Party, uh, the Social Democrats, uh, still uh, around, but really, 29 seats, right? That's how much they win. I mean, it gives you a, a sense of the size. By this time, Jun Chai has left the Social Democratic Party, formed his own party, uh, the Democratic... Uh, the, a democratic coalition, which gets uh, uh, some uh, some some seats, but um, it's funny that he, you know after Jiu Chai, who was this controversial figure who left, who led the socialists into such a disaster, actually he remains the most prominent person on the left. You know, so they were be forced to re-enter into a left coalition with him on the left side, on the center left, after he has destroyed them and formed his own party, but again, because it's so fragmented, they will be forced to do a coalition. Then you have Together 2014, and that, which is sort of a civic organization, Dialogue for, Hung Dialogue for Hungary, which is the party of the, that technocratic prime minister who was, who was in power for two years after Yu Chai had to resign. So you have a, a variety of groups on the, on the center left, and you have a reformed Alliance of Free Democrats, basically, you see it now, they call themselves straight the liberals because it's a classical liberal party, again, getting one seat, right? So it tells you that the, the left is in complete disarray. And the whole campaign, quote unquote campaign, leading to the election was, was, was a, a disaster because they, they obviously bickered amongst themselves because they don't get along. I mean, all of these are people who fought each other because of the, that disaster that happened during the last Yu Chai uh, government. And, and now they're forced to, to, to work together to win elections, and it, it ain't working, it ain't working. And then uh, you have Jobbik, which turns out to be, which grows since the last election, gets one-fifth of the vote, which is, you can imagine the danger, right? Uh, but gets only 11% of the, of the seats. Uh, and then you have politics can be different, which kind of decreases, uh, gets 5% um, of the votes, um, and then gets 2% of the seats, so it's, it's a, itself, you know, the problem with these reform parties is that they don't last long because they come, just like former opposition groups, they come in response to a problem, to a crisis, uh, that's what unites them, is that enough to create a, a governing, a true governing option, also it's hard for smaller parties to 
define themselves again in a system which has two major poles, because still, it kind of has two major poles, this is center-left, completely fragmented by the way, uh, center-right, far-right, and you know, sort of a green environmental reform party, small one. And that's the situation. So you see that basically the political system in Hungary is dominated today by Fidesz. It's dominated today by Fidesz. There are no real alternatives except for the only big, other big actor is Jobbik, which is anti-system, anti-democratic. I mean, it is truly the da a danger, truly a danger. So they're not an alternative. So we don't know what the, this is a situation today. It's a very strange situation in which clearly the I mean you do see uh, tremendous support still to the uh, you know relative forty four percent. It's tremendous to the for the for the center right for Fidesz and KDMP. Okay, uh, so that was the last uh, election. Viktor Orbán is the, still the prime minister. Okay, so let's discuss uh, uh, some of the key issues then about uh, uh, these. Uh, uh, you know, Hungarian politics today and since 1990, uh, and we'll conclude the lecture with that, but um, that's in the third part of the lecture.